Americans own a whole lot of guns, or at least some Americans do, and they lead to tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy in this country. And our next guest is trying to do something about it, both with his writing and as an organizer. Igor Volsky is the founder and director of Guns Down America, uh, which is a new uh, organization for sane gun policy. He is also a writer. He's appeared on uh, a lot of uh, mainstream outlets um, that are almost as good as the Zero Hour. And he uh, has written a lot of op-eds and that sort of thing. And his new book uh, is also called Guns Down. It's called Guns Down, How to Defeat the NRA and Build a Safer Future with Fewer Guns. So first of all, Igor, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me on. And secondly, um, as I was mentioning before we went on the air, uh, good name, Guns Down, <laughs> Guns Down America. Um, Catchy, uh, eye-catching, but let's go. Let's start with the organization Guns Down America. What prompted you? I, I knew you as a writer for a while. Uh, what prompted you to shift gears and go from writing to running an advocacy organization? Well, you know, it was really quite an accident. Uh, you'll remember on December second, twenty fifteen, there was a shooting in San Bernardino, California. I was uh, still working at Think Progress, uh, doing something entirely different, not connected to guns. But at the end of that day, I got back to my computer and I noticed all of these lawmakers sending their thoughts and prayers time and time again. Now, in and of itself, that's not particularly novel. They do that after every mass shooting. But what I began to realize is that the lawmakers who were sending the most, most of those tweets they voted against background checks in the aftermath of the shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. And something inside me just broke. That distance between what politicians say and what they actually do, I think, has always driven my political work. But the fact that they were trying to kind of fool their constituents into thinking that they actually care about that issue... Uh, that really just went too far. And so I spent the next eight hours tweeting out how much those thoughts and prayers politicians took from the gun lobby and arguing that the reason why they were only tweeting and not acting was partly because of those dollars. And so that brought me into the movement in a real way. And I realized that I could have a real value add because a lot of the existing organizations do great work, but they focus on what can you get done in this Congress or in the next Congress. And there was nobody talking about what is our long-term goal? What are we fighting for? And for us, and I write about this in the book, it's building a future with fewer guns. It's raising the standard of gun ownership and it's making guns significantly harder to get. Now let's talk about the objective uh, and, and, if you will, the labeling of what it is. I mean, you and I are, I, I, I believe, in sync on this issue, but let's talk about what it is we stand for. And, and, and I think as a writer, as well as advocate, you'll understand what I, I'm driving at. You, you describe yourself in the book as a fewer guns advocate. Um, and, and the reason why I'm interested in this question of what we say we're for is, is several fold. One, for one thing, we live in a society that has long glamorized and idealized and idolized guns, uh, and at least certain segments of it have, as a symbol of freedom, as a symbol of power, as a symbol of masculinity, and so on and so on. And we also live in a political culture that has tended to demonize and trivialize those of us who want a uh, saner gun policy, I mean, I, I'm thinking of, of a TV debate I did with a, a gun, uh, more guns person, <laughs> where after Newtown, where he said, he called me anti-gun. And I said, I'm not anti-gun, I'm pro-kindergartner. And it, it just strikes me that this whole issue of how we frame and express what it is we're trying to achieve. Is it fewer guns? Is it a rational distribution of guns? Is it uh, um, 
getting over 12-stepping, uh, you know, our, <laughs> our country's addiction to guns. Uh, do you get what I'm driving at? Yeah. No, I understand, Richard. You know, the key problem here and the way I came to fewer guns is I looked at all of the science on this issue, both domestically and internationally. And what became really clear to me, what all the science shows, is that where there are more guns, there are more gun deaths of really every kind. There are more gun suicides. There are more gun homic uh, homicides. There are more accidental shootings, mass shootings, police shootings, both police shooting at you and you shooting at police. And when I looked around and saw how other nations have uh, built safer communities, I realized that they made guns harder to get. They created a future where there were just fewer of the instruments uh, that are so deadly, particularly, of course, the assault-style weapons that are used in mass shootings, but also uh, handguns that are used in the everyday gun violence. And so I realized that on this issue, we know what to do. We know what works. And it turns out what we need aren't just background checks and closing a couple of loopholes the way advocates and a lot of politicians have talked about this issue for years. What we actually need are bolder solutions that regulate the gun industry, make guns harder to get, invest in the kind of community-based violence intervention programs that have reduced gun deaths in inner cities. So I'm actually quite optimistic about this because A, we know what to do, and B, the American people, I write about this in the book, the American people are already there. We just need the politicians to catch up. So in a sense, it's all, uh, and I agree with you about the American people being already there. So what, but why is it just the money? Why is it so hard for, I mean, I know there's a segment of the population that's just die hard, uh, no pun intended, uh, gun advocates. They just see guns as a reflection of their freedom. Uh, they see their world dissolving around them and guns to them are a symbol of how to preserve uh, some remnant of it and they're, they're being manipulated. But I mean, those people aside, and I do uh, yeah. uh, agree they're a minority of the population. Um, is it just the money in politics? Is it just the way the NRA throws money around that prevents our political system from addressing this crisis and doing something about it, you think? Well, you know, let me be clear. The, the folks to whom guns are part of their social identity, right? And that's part of the reason why the NRA has been so successful is that it's not just about the gun. It's everything the gun is wrapped in, which they wrap it in the American flag. They wrap it in patriotism. It becomes part of who those folks are. It represents their religion. It represents their patriotism. Those individuals um, make up a small group or a relatively small group of gun owners. You look at polling and the majority of gun owners actually support what I'm talking about, those three buckets of policies. So the question is, well, why haven't they been organized, right? Why haven't they been organized effectively? Why haven't we uh, took those people, added them to the majority of Americans who are not gun owners, who also overwhelmingly support the kinds of policies that I put forward? And I think part of the issue there is you have even champions of this issue in Congress and elsewhere are still using the talking points and the rhetoric of like 20 years ago, uh, after the 1994 midterms when Democrats lost a lot of seats. There's this muscle memory that yes, we can be bold on things like healthcare, we can ask for single payer, we can be bold on climate, we can ask for a Green New Deal. But when it comes to guns, we still have to bow down in front of the Second Amendment, which as I write in the book is a whole bunch of historical garbage. Um, we have to talk about maybe just a little background check here and closing a little loophole there, but we're still afraid to offer the kind of bold solutions we know work to address this crisis. And so that's part of the purpose of this book, to really change the conversation for the folks who are running for president, but really for Americans all across the country, for us to start asking on this issue for what we really want and for what we really need. So if I think of it in terms of organizing and pressuring politicians I, 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 to get the laws we need, I mean, I think of it 
if there was a whiteboard, you know, and I'm sure you'd map it out the same way there are local and state politicians we can target, then at the federal level, I would say, you know, the strategy for Democrats is, elim I, I can't think of a major Democratic politician that hasn't politicked on this issue by, you know, being soft on it at one time or another in their careers. So, uh, so if with Democrats, it would be eliminating the space that allow for them to do that, which I think the Democratic electorate is ready to do. And for Republicans, so I can kind of think, map it out in my own head, except for the Republicans. What is there to do except defeat them? Because I don't see how you move the de Democrats. I mean, I'm sorry, the Republicans uh, onto the correct side of this issue. Well, look, part of, part of the solution is definitely to vote. I mean, people should be voting out members who prioritize NRA and in, in industry dollars ahead of the lives of their constituents. That's no question. But I would suggest that the legislative route isn't the only option. We know from other movements, for instance, the marriage equality movement, the LGBT equality movement, corporations and corporate America really led the way um, in an innovative approach that they began to expand uh, and adopt LGBT inclusive employment practices. Uh, they began to tell conservative politicians in certain states, if you adopt this discriminatory law, we're taking our business elsewhere. That created progress, that created cultural change. It also created space for politicians to then to start to move in the right direction. And so a lot of the work that we do at Guns Down America really focuses not just on the legislative approach, but also this different channel. And so for instance, just several days ago, we launched a campaign in the New York Times called Is Your Bank Loaded? And if folks go to isyourbankloaded.org, they'll see the top 15 banks. Each bank's gonna have a grade that's uh, indicative of how close they are to the gun industry. And then they could push their bank to, uh, to do better, to stop doing business with the gun industry until that industry is fundamentally reformed. Now, we launched this campaign, uh, the New York Times called Every Single Bank on Our Metric, and I gotta say, Richard, to my surprise, you immediately saw banks distancing themselves from the gun industry, saying, well, our portfolio is very small and we're taking steps to move in the right direction. Just yesterday at the House financial uh, reform hearing, you had a member of Congress press Jamie Dimon on our research and on our campaign. And he pledged that he would look into policies that minimize their exposure to guns. That is critical progress that we can start making without waiting for politicians to change the laws because frankly, our lives are on the line. People are dying right now. So this, these are ways that every American can plug in to help drain the gun industry and to change the way it does business so that the militarized firearms that are now so pervasive in the civilian market, uh, so that begins to change. Yeah, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it's funny, Igor, because, uh, you know, part of me is hardcore lefty and wants to say, I don't want to ask corporations to do anything, but we're talking about saving uh, children's lives here and other people's lives here. And I'm all for applying pressure at every point that it can be applied to do something effective. And that's a really interesting approach. I know after Newtown, I wrote a couple pieces tracking the money through hedge funds to gun manufacturers and so on. I haven't done it for a while, so I'm not up to date on, but I have read about uh, your work in this area and I totally support it. Uh, I will say in terms of the book that it's extremely well written, well organized, oh, clear. Um, and uh, and covers, I think, all all the salient points. So uh, you your last chapter is entitled "We Will Win." Um, <laughs> uh, very kind of Castro touch of history will absolve us. Um, so uh, is that how we'll win by applying pressure through corporations as well as through voting and letting our elected officials know we want better policies? Yeah, I mean, as as you point out, it's going to require pressure from every single angle. But, 
you know, I also write in the book about the similarities between the gun control movement and the marriage equality movement. And for me, the biggest similarity is that you really started to see a turning point on LGBT equality in the midst of the AIDS crisis when gay people realized that they had to start coming out of the closet in order to survive. And you saw Americans of all walk of, walks of life suddenly realizing, oh, my neighbor is gay, my friend is gay, my brother, my sister, my cousin, I can't deny them equality, I can't deny them rights. And you, you began to see that tipping point in society. I think the same thing is true on the gun issue. We're now at a point where mothers and fathers are afraid to send their children to the movie theater, to school, to a concert, out of fear something would happen. Mothers and fathers in inner cities are afraid to leave their house, are afraid to allow their child uh, to go to the playground. And of course, if you talk to young people all around the country, uh, I was in Colorado, uh, in Littleton, Colorado, the site of the Columbine shooting, uh, and spoke to students who are current uh, current seniors in Columbine. This issue is in their blood. Parkland resonated with them to such a degree. They saw themselves in the 17 people who died. They saw themselves in the leaders of the March for Our Lives movement. They're not going to stop fighting until they can solve this problem so that they're not a victim, so that their sister or brother are not a victim, so their future children don't have to leave live with the fear and threat of, of gun violence. And so I really do believe that as gun ownership is shrinking in this country, and as Americans are waking up to the reality of what's happening, that there is no going back on this issue. It's a matter, it's just a question of how forcefully can we push it in the right direction and save as many lives as possible in the process. So those people who think that a, tr a traditional marriage has to be a man and a woman and 65 guns are going to just have to <laughs> evolve on this. And, and by the way, as you point out in the book, uh, it, 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 it's, it's not just the horrors of a parkland or a Columbine, but for example, it's, it, it, it's, it's children of color getting shot every single day because we have an overproliferation of weapons, so we have no segment of our society where this isn't a crisis. So unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but Igor Volsky, where can people find out? The book is Guns Down, How to Defeat the NRA and Build a Safer Future with, with Fewer Guns. Where can people find out more about your organization? So they could go to gunsdownamerica.org, and we're also going on tour. We're doing 20 town halls all across the country to plug people into our work. Folks can find out the dates at gunsdowntour.com, gunsdowntour.com. All right. Well, uh, great work. Thanks for that, and thanks for coming on the program. Thank you. Really appreciate it.